Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to go there in just a second. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. This morning you get a pastor who's hopped up on cold medicine. So this might be a fun service. I mean, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I'm like, this is going to be fun. We'll see what happens. You know how it is when you get a cold and you're struggling and you take enough medicine because you're, you're miserable, but then you realize you took maybe a little too much medicine and now you're feeling a little too good, you know, one of those things. I'm like, dry me up, dry me up. And all of a sudden I'm going, whoa, there went my mind. So this morning I want to talk to you about being children of the light and what that means and what I mean by that. Uh, last week we talked about being ambassadors for Christ. We're all ambassadors for Christ. But if we have nothing to give, nothing to offer as an ambassador of Christ, then what good are we, kind of, if I can just say it simply that way. And so there's a challenge for us to be children of the light. You know, sometimes we don't always have the right answer, and sometimes we make mistakes, and, and sometimes we go down paths we didn't choose necessarily. You know, I told you that I've been fighting with this cold, and I, I tell you what, it was one of those times where nothing seemed to go right. I'm coming home last night. We went out to get some hy V Chinese, because I was cooking that night, and... Uh, we ate a high V and they hop in the car, and I'm starting to get that glazed over, you know, yeah, man, you know, that kind of a feeling. And uh, I get to an intersection and I stop the car because that's what you do when there's stop signs, right? But there was no stop sign. I just stopped and sat there, and Dre goes, uh, Dad? <laughs> oh, there's no stop sign here. And I, I missed that. So everything I touched seemed to either break or fall. I couldn't find it. I even put my pants on backwards yesterday. Can you believe that? It was sweatpants, so you just get discouraged. You want to give up. I mean, nothing works. Nothing's happening. Nothing's, you know, I just want to throw in the towel. Sometimes we can feel that way in a relationship with God. And what I want to share today, I want to try to keep it as simple as possible. Not to take anything away. I mean, I can talk for an hour and a half. Well, not really, but if I wanted to, it's not about the words or how long we talk. It's about what's said and that you catch the truth of what God is speaking in the midst of it. He's called us to be children of the light. And in Ephesians chapter 5, a man by the name of Paul speaks to us. And he says in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But do not let immorality or impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person, covetous man, who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. He's telling you and me today, that we once walked in darkness, but we now walk in the light, now walk in the light. The question is, how? How do I know when I am and when I'm not? Uh, uh, you've got to understand, sometimes we, Paul writes this to us, but Paul writes this to us w with a whole different aspect and understanding. You know, before Paul was Paul, Paul was Saul. <laughs> back, if you go back and you look at the whole road to Damascus thing that went on, do you remember when he was going down the road to Damascus and it says that a bright light uh, shined and hit him and knocked him down. And there was a revealing that took place because of that light that hit him. Now here he is in Ephesians and he's writing and saying, uh, you were once in darkness, now you're children of the light. Walk in that light. What made the difference? What brought the change? Well, Paul was a man who uh, was just like you and me. Okay, Paul was a man. He wasn't a very good speaker. According to some of the scripture, You know, it's not like he could wax eloquently and, and have everyone just eating out of the palm of his hands. He wasn't the greatest talker. Uh, he was somebody who found his profession in being a Jewish scholar. He wanted to be a, uh, a scholar and be able to educate and do some teachings that way. And it says that Paul went through a lot of things, and, but when he experienced the touch from Jesus Christ, it changed everything about him. That's what made all the difference in the world. Paul was, uh, he was a Pharisee. He, he did everything he could to impose his beliefs on others he tried to do everything he could to condemn Christians. He even got permission to go as far as to arrest all of them that he found as Christians to bring them back for judgment, imprisonment, even death. 
And he's traveling down the road to Damascus. And, and it tells us in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. I'll just read it to you real quick. It says, uh, Saul, blah, blah, blah. Let's go down to verse 4. He fell to the ground as he's traveling on the road to Damascus. He fell to the ground because a light from heaven flashed around him. And a voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Rise and enter the city, and it shall be told to you what you must do. There was an experience that happened on that road, uh, on the way, that totally changed his life because he was a persecutor of Christians. He did everything he could. When Stephen, the first martyr in the Bible, was stoned, guess who was there? Saul. He was holding the coats of everybody that was beating him up. He was partaking in that. Now all of a sudden there's a transformation that took place, and now he's one of the, one of the most well-known disciples of Christ and, and following after him. Well, what pastor does that have to do with me? It means this. You could be a far, as far away from God as you think you could possibly get, and he still loves you and will never leave you or forsake you. He can use you. There's nothing that you could have screwed up so bad that God can't extend his grace. So if you're here today and you've ever felt like you're not worthy, let's just clear that all up. None of us are. None of us are worthy. But it's God's grace that he extends to you and to me. So Paul here in Ephesians says something. He says, You were once in darkness, now walk in the light, because we're children of the light. No longer was Paul living for himself once he experienced the touch from Christ. He was now living for himself. He was now not imposing his beliefs on others. He, he was imposing the beliefs of God Almighty and sharing that with them. It, he now, instead of looking at him, people would fear him because we may die at the hands of this man. Now they can look at him, and what do they see? They see Jesus Christ. There's a whole change that took place. He learned what it meant to walk in the light, and he wants you and I to be able to do the same thing. Well, what does that mean, walk in the light? When I talk about walking in the light, what I'm saying is, is that we have to learn to experience Christ's love on his level, not ours. We have to learn to experience that. You know, last week I said we talked about being ambassadors for Christ. In other words, um, ambassadors uh, that let his light shine, they do so, and God not only shines that light to people, but he, he works it through you. It's not about just being a good Christian. Hey, I attend church. I've got a Bible. It's do you become a part of what God is doing? Do you not just have a Bible, but do you crack it open? Do you read it? Do you find out what God wants to speak to you? Do you get involved and use the gifts that God has given you? See, when we do that, we experience his love. But have you ever discovered that, that no matter how hard you try, you and my, our level of love, do you know that it's limited? Have you ever experienced that? There comes a point when we want to stop loving sometimes. Do you ever have unlovable people in your life and God's told you to love them? Now, you don't have to nod because they might be sitting right next to you. But the question is, is when God calls us to love even those that are unlovable, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that because we're children of the light. That means we're not going to look at those people through our physical eyes and, and pronounce a judgment. We have to start seeing people through his eyes so we can see what it is that we need to be. We don't have to fix them. We don't have to correct them. We don't have to take responsibility for anybody else. But you do have to take responsibility for yourself. You do have to let the Holy Spirit speak to you and work through you so you can be a light that shines in dark places. Paul, great example. He kind of led the way and showed us what it is that we need to do. And basically what we're learning here is this. When we are children of the light and experience his love in our life on his level, then we will fulfill, fulfill the greatest commandment God told us to. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the second's like unto it. What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. So he basically says, love God, love others. And do it in that order. First love God, then love others. And when you do, you experience this whole level of love. All of a sudden you realize you have a purpose in life. I don't know if you've ever thought that you were a mistake or if you've ever thought that I don't have any giftings, but you do. It's finding out what they are and tapping into those. You become alive because you discover that in the midst of light is life that happens. See, when I say we live as children of the light, that means that we operate on his level of love, not on our level of love. Why? Because our love can be limited. When I say we're living as children of the light, that means that we draw our strength and our purpose from the Lord, not anybody else or anywhere else. Uh, living as children in the light means that we are to love others just as Christ loves us. But as I said, sometimes it's hard to love some people. It, it feels almost downright impossible at least with our definition of love. 
That's why we've got to hear what he has to say. Have you ever discovered, like I have, that, that my love is limited? I, sometimes I, I, I don't have what it takes. What are we supposed to do then? You see, we have to learn to tap into his resources. In Ephesians that we read there, verse 8, it says that you and I were once in darkness. Did you know that? We were once in darkness. And now we've come into this marvelous light. This darkness, if you look at the word, the word is skotos, and it means this, restrain or stop, or when one is overcome by the night and they're forced to stop because of the darkness. Have you ever walked in a room and it's so dark you can't see your hand in front of your, in front of your face? You ever have that? You ever get put in a room where it gets that dark and you're not familiar with the room? You don't know where to go. You don't know where to walk. You don't know if there's a cliff up ahead. You don't know if you're going to bump into furniture. It's that kind of darkness, he says, and he implies it to the spiritual relationship and says, you were once in that darkness. You were once in such a dark place that your soul, it, it was in a dark place and you couldn't see the light that I had for you. You didn't want it. You were going through misery and going through pain and there was a spiritual darkness. But he says, but I've paid the price and call you children of the light. Now walk as children of the light. When he uses the word light, it's using the, this word uh, phos which is the light of sun uh, of the day. See, darkness and light, they're different. When it's so dark, you can't see, that's a scary thing. I always remember my mom and dad. Um, years ago, my dad was used to, you know, uh, sometimes nature calls in the middle of the night, and you go take care of business, you come back in, and my dad would just flop down on the bed. The only problem is, is this night when he did it, he forgot that mom rearranged the furniture the day before. And so when he came into the room, he just... <whistles> and Boom, he hit the ground. I mean, the floor shook, you know, earthquake. And my mom wondering what's going on. He got comfortable with the way things were. And in the midst of the darkness, he took the next key plunge and he hit rock bottom. You know, that's the kind of darkness that he's talking about. Too many times we're living in a... Did you guys remember the, the next key commercial or did I just date myself? Okay. Sometimes we're in a darkness that's so dark and we become so comfortable with the darkness that we feel we can just roll wherever we want, wherever we want to. We can do what we want. But the problem is, is if God wants to rearrange some things, we're eventually going to hit rock bottom. That's going to be a problem. That's the kind of darkness it's saying that you and I are in. But because of God's grace and His salvation power, He says, you are now children of the light. You are now fast. You're like the light of day. And this word also means, when it uses the word light, it means it is a, uh, it's, it's always burning. It's never kindled. It's never started. Therefore, since it's never kindled, it's never quenched. It's a fire that doesn't need something outside of itself to produce a fire for itself. It's something that is constantly lit. It's that kind of light. He said, that's the light that you need in your life because any of your man-made lights, they're not going to do anything. A flashlight. This dinky little thing. You know what? Dollar store. Cheap. Put some batteries in it, the light will shine, but if I leave it on all the time, how long is it going to be before it goes dead? There's a limit to what can be done in the midst of this light. And God is calling us to be a light, but we're not going to be able to do it in this way unless we understand we must tap into this type of light, one that is never quenched. And the only place you find that is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the midst of his presence is a fullness of joy. He gives you his grace. And most people are afraid to go to that place and trust God with their whole heart because I did that once before and I got burned. Or maybe you got hurt. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. But we've been called children of the light. What I want to focus on today is, is you know, I asked the Lord, I said, God, what do you, this is kind of how it goes when I'm trying to figure out what to do. You know, God, what do you want to, what do you, what do you want to talk about? You know, where are you leading us? Where, and for this particular Sunday, uh, I had a picture of a lighthouse. It was just a light. You know the purpose of a lighthouse is to shine in a dark place. But this particular lighthouse didn't have the brightest bulb in it. All right? It was a little bit dim. I mean, it was shining, but, you know, maybe it made it three blocks down, and that was about it. And as I was praying, I just thought, why is that light so dim? And, and it's almost as if God said, that's a good question, Jim. Because when you find that answer and what limits that light from shining, then you will see that if you will correct it, that your light will so shine if you are tapping into the right source. You see, I believe that there's things that limit us. You know, when, when you want to be all that you can be, all that God's created you to be, but there's things that hold you back. I want to share with you four things that I believe 
limit us in our effectiveness to let our light so shine. God has called us, and when I say, you know, let our light so shine, what, is, what do you mean? I mean having a relationship with Christ that transforms you so that when people see you, they see Jesus. That's what we're talking about. You can't be an ambassador for Christ if you don't know what he's saying. What are you going to pass along? So, there's things that limit us. Write this first one down for me. Things that limit God. The thing that will limit us is if we're drawing power or we're drawing from the wrong power source. Our effectiveness will be limited if we are drawing from the wrong power source. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if, if you're not making Jesus Christ the center of your life and actively seeking Him and pursuing Him, things will start to fade away. You ever feel like things are fading away and you're saying, I just want more of Jesus, I just want more of Jesus. And He might be sitting there saying, I'm right here. But what are you going to do? There's a part that we play. Sometimes we're limited because we're drawing from the wrong power source. We're trying to do it in our own strength. I got this one. I can take care of this. I know exactly what to do. I've got it all figured out. So God, you come with me. Hang back there. Watch my six. And all of a sudden, if I get in trouble, I'll cry help. That's not walking as children of the light. That, that's, that's getting in front of God. Getting in God's way, basically. What we need to do is be able to draw our power and our source from Him. Because if not, it's going to limit our effectiveness. It's like trying to run something, something that normally runs by DC power, direct current, and trying to make it run with AC power, alternating current. It would be like taking a flashlight. Let's say I had a cord on it. We plug it into a 220 outlet. What's going to happen? Chances are this thing's going to go, poof, and the bulb will blow. But if you woke up this morning, ladies, and you wanted to do your hair and dry it, let's say you had a battery-operated hair dryer. How many of you guys would like to buy one of those? Why won't you buy one of those? It runs on batteries. It'll wear out. And I know how long those hair dryers have to go. <laughs> you would not do it because the power source is horrible. You want me to dry my hair with a battery-operated hair dryer? That's no, more re <clears throat> That's no more ridiculous than saying, I want to walk with Christ and I want all His benefits, but I don't want to do anything. Just give it to me. It doesn't work that way. If you start drawing from the wrong power source, it will limit your effectiveness. The great news is, is you can do something about that. You know, when Lisa and I were in Bible college, and, and I hope you guys don't mind, but I'm taking this jacket off because I'm cooking up here. <clears throat> when we went to Bible college in Christ for the Nations in Dallas, Texas, home of the Dallas Cowboys, by the way. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that. God's favorite team. You know that's the Star of David on their helmet, right? No? <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> Hold on a minute. Take my coat off. I'm hot. I, I was talking about something. Um, cold medicine's great. Being a light in a dark place requires you to have the right power source. So could it be that when you say, I don't feel as effective, I don't feel like, feel like uh, I have what it takes, could it be that maybe you're drawing from the wrong source? Maybe you're looking at yourself to accomplish something rather than looking to Christ to work in and through you because greater is He that's within you than anything in this world. You know, this morning I didn't want to come. I felt awful. But I knew this. I knew if I showed up, so would God. He said, sometimes you just got to take a step of faith. Not to mention, Tim, John, and my dad are all out of town. Because so. <laughs> I probably would have used one of them. Uh, my dad's in Cedar Rapids installing a new pastor. John's in Chicago. And Pastor Tim's speaking in Esterville, Illinois, back at his home church, uh, where he grew up. So if you tap into the wrong power source, you won't get the benefits. Brahms, that's where I was. I was in Dallas, Texas. I knew it would come back to me. When we were in Dallas, Dallas, Texas, hang tight with me. It's going to be a fun ride. We didn't get to see a lot of each other. We would go to school in the morning, we'd have lunch, and then we'd work till 11 or midnight, get up, do it all over again. 
Sundays, we only had to do two services. So we would go to his church in the morning and then our school church service in the afternoon, and then we had the, the rest of the night free. So you know what we did? Brahms ice cream. Have you ever heard of Brahms ice cream? Anyone? It's, it's typically in the south. I don't think there's any in the north here. I'm not sure. But they have something called cappuccino chocolate chunk ice cream. Oh, wait, it's so good. It is so good. They also have a strawberry shortcake sundae. Sometimes I, I may have gotten both. I don't know. They are so good. We, we would take a trip there, and we were at Brahms, and we were in the line ordering our ice cream full of anticipation and excitement. I mean, we're going to eat Brahms. We're excited because, number one, we're broke, and this is about all we can afford. So this was kind of like the, the, the thing we would do. And as we're waiting in line, we we're talking and getting excited. What are you going to get? What are you going to get? Hey, I said, did you notice the, the interior lights are dimmer than usual? And I thought, oh, maybe I got that thing. You know how you got a dial where you can increase that? No, that thing's up, up there. Ah, it's going to be okay. We drove, we waited a little bit more. The, the, it was getting dimmer. The power was diminishing. And I noticed my headlights on the car in front of uh, me bouncing back, my headlights were like a tan color. I mean, things were dying down. And we said, uh-oh, our car, something's wrong. But we're two cars away from ordering our ice cream. You know what we had to do? We had to pull out a line and go back to school because that car was about to die. Now, here's the good part of the story. We jumped in the other car and went back to Brown's, Okay. We're no idiots. We're going to get our Brahms. <clears throat> I had a guy look it over, and I don't know a lot about cars. I know how to start them. <coughs> I know how to fill them with gas. I know there's a dipstick in there that you check the oil, but why would I want to do that? Exactly. it will give me problems later down the road, won't it? I don't know how to fix cars. But when this guy looked at my car, he said, Jimmy, he said, your alternator's gone bad. He said, what's happening is, is because that's bad, it's, if I'm remembering right, it's designed to help recharge the life of the battery, and when that's not functioning properly, it will drain from the wrong source, and your car will go dead. My car wasn't functioning properly. It couldn't draw the power necessary on its own. It needed something else. Otherwise, there was going to be death. You see, we need to make sure that we're tapping into the right source. And what, what's the most important thing? Relationship with Him and the relationship with others. We need to make sure we're tapping into the right source, that we're talking to God, that we're listening to God, that we're getting into the Word of God. It's not enough to just come and hear a preacher preach. That's not what brings salvation. It's about you confessing Him as Lord and Savior for your life. Then after that, we as a body of believers, together grow and mature. That's the goal. But if we're drawing from the wrong power source, we're going to be limited. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God. If you're drawing from the wrong power source and you need to correct it, then be an imitator of God. Watch what God says and what God does, and then do what God says and do what God does. He sets the example, and by doing this, you get things back into alignment. Tap into the power source, Jesus Christ. Be an imitator of Him. Look at the examples that Jesus sets and then follow them. You've got to tap into the right power source. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. Second thing is this. One of the reasons we're limited is because we allow an attitude of compromise. I'm assuming today that you're here because you want to hear from the Holy Spirit. I know it's never good to assume, but I believe we're here because we want to grow in our relationship with Christ. So we have to ask ourselves the question, if we're going to grow, what is it that we need to know? What are some of these things that limit us from growing spiritually and our effectiveness to reach others? Well, draw from the right power source and don't allow compromise. You know, there was a Russian that was out hunting one day out in the woods. And he was doing some bear hunting. And so when he was going around there, he had his gun and he's getting out ready. All of a sudden he sees a bear and he goes, oh, a bear! And he gets the gun and he lines it up and all of a sudden the bear goes, whoa, 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 time out. Time out, hold on a minute there. And the hunter was astonished. He just dropped his gun. He said, did that bear just talk? And the bear said, yeah, hold on a minute, hold on. Why, why do you want to shoot me? And he says, well, the bear asked him, what do you want? He says, well, I'm out hunting because I want a fur coat. The hunter looked at the bear and said, why? What do you want? He said, well, I'm hungry. He said, I'd like a full stomach. So the bear said, 
why don't we go over here and sit down. Let's talk about this for a minute and see if we can't work this out. A couple minutes later, the bear got up and walked away alone with a full stomach. The hunter had his fur coat. Think about it. Compromise will eat you up. <laughs> that was a pathetic one, wasn't it? I love it. The great thing is, is I'll forget I said it in 10 minutes, so I might even say it again, so just laugh if I do. Compromise. Compromise, if you look at the way it's defined, it's, I was just looking around because sometimes we change the definition of it a little bit. We say it's a way of, uh, compromise is a way of agreeing or reaching an agreement in which persons or people are in a dispute, but they bring a balance to it. Uh, uh, compromise is something that combines two qualities from two different things. Plain and simple, compromise is this. Compromise is simply changing the question to fit the answer. And that's what we do in life. We have it all figured out. We got all the answers. We know what we're going to do. So as soon as somebody starts asking the right questions, see, we get it backwards. It, compromise is simply changing the question to fit the answer. And God says, don't compromise in those areas of your life. Be a light that shines in dark places, not diminishes your ability to shine. And compromise will do that. It will diminish your ability to shine. Now, you might ask, well, is compromise always bad? Well, no, not, not always. I mean, we do it all the time with our children. Um, if you'll do this, then we'll let you do that. You do it in relationships. But the thing is, is God's not looking. When God speaks to you and, and to me, God, did you know God's not looking for a discussion? He's not looking for a debate. He's not calling for a vote. He's simply saying, I've spoken. Now, what are you going to do with what I spoke? Either we'll say yes or we'll say no. And if we say nothing at all, it's the same as saying no. Why? Because it's not until you do something. You be a doer of the word. That's why God uh, chose Paul. Paul was in all flattering and could tell the greatest stories, but what he did do was when God spoke, he obeyed. He did something with what God told him to do. God, he's looking for us to be doers of the word. Ephesians 5, 4 says, There must be no filthiness or silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give thanks. What, what is he saying there? He's saying, I'm looking for those that are always looking to compromise, and we've got to cut that area out of our life. If you compromise in areas of your life, you cannot have the best that God has for you. Otherwise, if we allow that and we become a people of compromise when it comes to God, we will be limited. It will, it will blur our vision. You know, I remember driving around once, in, uh, I think it was in our van, and I kept saying, man, it's kind of foggy outside. Why is it so foggy? And I kept blaming the outside, the outside. It's foggy, it's foggy, it's foggy. Only to find out nothing was foggy outside. It was a dirty film on the inside of the window. See, the problem wasn't out there. The problem was in here. And the problem is the same in our lives. If we're not careful, we're going to start looking at everything else that's wrong, not realizing that nothing's really It's about them. It's about in here. It's on the inside. Have you ever, for those of you that wear glasses, ever walked around and went, man, and everything's so messy around here and so, so dim in that. And then you take your glasses off and go, oh my gosh, I guess it wasn't you. It was me. You guys are all fuzzy right now. You know, many times we forget that the real work that needs to happen first is on the inside. It has to happen there. God's not looking to beat us up and, and mold us into anything other than his image. He wants to give us his best. So we have to be sure not to allow those areas of life, the filthiness it talked about, the silly talk, the coarse jesting. What it's talking about is, is I'm looking for people who are ready for the truth, not to compromise in any area of their life. Otherwise, you'll end up missing the best that God has for you. Ephesians 5.8 says, You were formerly darkness, but now you are light of the world. Walk in that light. That's what he's calling us to. Number three, write this one down. What else limits us? Taking shortcuts. Taking shortcuts. Have you ever taken a shortcut that ended up being longer than it actually would have been if you took the original route? <laughs> Don't you hate that? We came back from Dubuque one night, and I decided I was going to put my faith in my GPS. What was I thinking? I ended up out in a cornfield in a town I never knew existed. 
But you know why I ended up there? Because I told the GPS, you know, you can say, take me on highways or interstates, or the shortest route possible. The shortest route possible? You bet, buddy. You know, I hit that thing. Who else wouldn't do that? Why? We want the shortest route. I don't want to be driving around all day. Give me the shortcut. And so I punched that in there, and before you know it, I'm in Hee Haw land, you know, looking around going, what in the world? I don't even, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. What's going on? I, don't, I can't find out where I'm at. My, my GPS is saying, reroute, or turn here, or turn there. And I'm thinking, where am I? By the time we got home, I think it took us an extra 10 or 20 minutes than if we would have just followed the original route. It happens all the time. Shortcuts. But do you know shortcuts will limit God's best for your life? He says that if you want to be the light of the world, don't take a shortcut. Take God's best. Why did I take a shortcut? I took a shortcut because I wanted to save time. I took a shortcut because I thought I knew better. I took a shortcut because I trusted in something rather than someone. And the, the same is true. Many times, that's why we take shortcuts when it comes to God. We think we know better. We think we've got this figured out. We have a better plan. We have a better idea. Only to, to discover we don't know what we're talking about. He says, don't take shortcuts. Hey, have you ever had somebody, an electrician or a technician, you, you had a piece of equipment and they said, oh, you're going to have to get something new because this thing shorted out. A short circuit. A short circuit is there's a path that electrical current is to flow. And whenever there's a brokenness within that path, what happens is that electricity, that electrical path, it, it gets rerouted into an un, uh, unattended position. It ends up shorting out. And it, it's an unintended path. And all of a sudden, it's no good. It's kind of like this flashlight here. I'm sure there's a little wire in there somewhere under the switch because it says when you flick it on, it tells it to turn it on. Flick it the other way, it tells it to shut it off. It has a little wire in there. You can open the contact, close the contact. Open the contact, close the contact. But when it breaks and it shorts out, you can do whatever you want. It's not going to work. You know, if we're not careful, if we take shortcuts in our walk with Christ, we're going to think that we can just turn, turn things on and off with the push of a button. Now I need Jesus. Now I don't. Now I need Jesus. Now I don't. And when you short-circuit things, you're going to go, what's, what's going on? Shortcuts will compromise the greatest things that he has for you and for me. Ephesians 5.5 5 says, For this you, uh, you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person, covetous man who's an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Well, isn't being good just good enough? What do you think? Is being good good enough? Yeah, it re really, it depends on your definition of what good is. But being good isn't good enough. But I went to church, and, 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 uh, and I told the pastor I liked this sermon once. That doesn't impress God. He wants to know, have you opened up your heart and your life to him? Have you experienced him on, on that level of relationship? God says there's only one way to inherit the kingdom of God, and that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, having that, now that we're learning to walk as children of the light, let Christ be the source of your power. He says, don't compromise, don't take any shortcuts, because it will limit the best that God has for you. Again, walking as children of the light means walking in that understanding of His love for you and for others. But the problem is, is we, ha we have an enemy. <clears throat> And he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you agree? You should, because it's in the Bible. So, you ever feel though that, like God, or the enemy's got one of these suckers right here? He's pointing at you. <laughs> You're next. You're next. And I'm coming after you. And you feel like he's got all these circumstances: discouragement, despair, depression, incompetency. And he wants to just beat you down with it. But you go. But I have a light. And the enemy says, I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy. And you're over here saying, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But the enemy wants to do that. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this broke? They're like, somebody get an usher. He's swinging a sledgehammer. <laughs> is it obvious to you that this is broken? You're sure. Do you think this light will work? If I put batteries in it, 
do a little MacGyver job on this thing. You think I can get her going? Maybe you could. We're talking to me right now, okay? <laughs> it's broken. Do you know that one of the major things that limits us in our walk with Christ has nothing to do with anybody else but ourselves? It's because we're broken. That's number four if you want to write that down. What limits us is brokenness. And here's the thing. You can look at this and go, well, Pastor, duh, it's broken. You just, you just hit it with a sledgehammer. I mean, I see pieces everywhere. It's broken. I'm pretty sure. And we can go through life and you can have brokenness that maybe is visible on the outside, but what about the brokenness that's on the inside that nobody sees? This is obvious. This is apparent. I can see this. But what about the broken parts in our life that nobody else sees? What about the broken parts in our lives that we know are there, but we've learned to shove it off to the side? We've learned to put it in a closet. We've learned to drink it away. We've learned to not, not entertain that thought. Do you really feel better? No. One of the reasons you say, but I want more of Christ. You know, sometimes God will bring us to a place of brokenness. Not to harm us, but to heal us. See, you can be going through brokenness on the outside and say, it's obvious. I'm going through divorce. It's obvious. I've lost a loved one. It's obvious. I, I've been in trouble with the law. Did I just say that one? Okay. My brain just went, you repeated yourself. But what about what's not obvious? What about the things where, in the quietness of your own home and your own life, where God says, that's not right. Or he says, I want to heal this area where you were hurt. And I don't want to go there. Why don't you want to go there? You know why? Here's the reality of brokenness. Brokenness hurts. And we don't want to hurt. Brokenness is painful, and we don't want to experience pain. I mean, Pastor, I, I went through that brokenness, that hurt. Why would I ever want to go back to that? So you can get healing once and for all. So you'll never have to go back and deal with that. You see, brokenness can come in so many different forms and fashions. And in the Bible, it's amazing to me to see that God, many times we say, brokenness, avoid it, danger, danger. You know, stay away from that. What well, we start praying is prayers like this. Lord, take the hammer away. We start praying things like, just don't let the enemy touch me anymore. Just let the enemy be gone. And you can pray like that, but, but the enemy's not going anywhere. You know why? Because he wants to knock you out. It's hammer time. And he's coming after you. And we say, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to go there. But we've got to understand, brokenness is real and it hurts. If you were hammering away and you bang and you hit your thumb, you know what you do? You grab your thumb and you go, oh! And you start praising Jesus, right? <laughs> I'm sure his name might have come up at some point in time there. And there would be pain. So what we decide is, is I'm never picking this thing up again. If I don't pick it up, there's no way I'll have to experience that pain ever again. But the problem is, is you're not going to get anything done if you don't use the tools God gives. So you'll either not want to pick up the hammer once again, or if you do, I'll tell you this, next time you swing that hammer, you're going to be very careful, aren't you? You're going to go, thumb goes to the right. <laughs> there. It's in the midst of brokenness that sometimes God brings a healing. In the Bible, listen to this. It wasn't until Jacob, when he was wrestling with the angel, do you remember that? It, he dislocated Jacob's hip. He broke an area in his life, and it was then when it was broken that God brought the blessing. Gideon in the Bible and his 300 men, the men broke the jars that were in their hands which symbolized the brokenness in their lives, and when they broke those jars, then the hidden light that they couldn't see before uh, rose and, and, and the enemy they were facing had to flee. It wasn't until the Bible where Mary broke the alabaster jar of perfume. Do you remember this? It, it was a jar and there was a seal upon that. And it wasn't until she you know, did one of those and broke the seal that it made all the difference in the world. Did you know that when she broke open that, that, that perfume, it destroyed the usefulness or the value of what it was worth? Once it was opened, it started to decrease and diminish because the seal was broken. But, but the Bible says that, that the fragrance filled the room and, and, and Jesus was honored in the midst of it. It wasn't until Jesus took the five loaves. You remember what he did? 
He broke it. And it's not until he broke it that he could multiply it to a number of 5,000. It wasn't until Jesus hung on the cross and let his body be broken for you and me so that we could have eternal life. Oh, but pastor, you know, I want Jesus in my life and my heart, but, but I'm afraid I won't have any fun. I'm going to tell you this right now. I've had more fun being a Christian than I ever did being a non-Christian. People say, oh, that's ridiculous. That's because you're old now. <laughs> you know, many times we don't want to trust God in certain areas of our lives because we think we know better. He hung on the cross tree of Calvary and his body was broken for you and for me so that we could be sons and daughters of the light. Not just a light, but the light. The one that's unquenchable. The one that says when your world is falling apart, His light will still shine. The one that says you can build on that foundation. It's the one that says if you want the kingdom of God, then you must understand what it means to experience this light because it has to do with the love of Christ. If you have people in your life that are hard to love, you can start learning to love them. Not because you're so much greater or better, but because of Christ who's in you. I'm not a good mom. Well, chances are you probably are a better mom than you really are giving yourself credit for, but you can be the greatest mom when you start allowing Jesus to rearrange those things in your life and take and heal that brokenness in your life so that you can be better for your daughter and for your son. Well, I'm not the greatest dad. Chances are you're a better dad than you're giving yourself credit for, but even if you are or aren't, it doesn't really matter. If you bring your brokenness to Jesus and allow him to heal your heart, you will be better because of it, and your children will be better because of it. When you become the light and walk in that as Christ has called us to do, then we experience a whole new thing. The Bible says in John 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Do you understand what that means? I didn't either at first. Years ago when I read that, and I started thinking about brokenness. I believe that many of us are here today and we're experiencing brokenness. And we're not going back to this place because that was too painful. But maybe God's telling you, you know what? I got all the pieces. And I don't want to give you what you once had. He wants to just clear the slate. He says, I want to give you something brand new. But you have to be willing to come back to this place and let me heal your heart. Maybe you went through the ugliness of a divorce. Painful things were said. Hurtful things had been done. Maybe there was a trauma or a tragedy that happened to you in your life and you felt like you could never forgive the person for doing what they did. But if you let the Lord take you back to that place of brokenness, you'll see that in the midst of the brokenness, He can bring a blessing. And it's the blessing that we want and we desire. Maybe you're here today and, and, and you're broken financially. Maybe you're here today and you're broken in your ambitions. You're broken in your reputation or your, your, your spirit and your will has been broken. Maybe even your body is broken. The Bible says that God is near to those with what? A broken heart. He's near to those. Maybe today you know, you know that God's speaking to you. You know something's broken. Maybe today is the day that God wants to bring that healing. You know, as a matter of fact, let me, let me put it to you another way, not in question form. Today is the day. God wants to bring healing. So the real question on the floor is this. Do you really want to receive it? Do you really want to be healed in that area of your life so you can be all that God's called you to be? Because these things will take away. They will limit us if we're at the wrong power source, if we're compromising, if we're taking shortcuts, and if we're going through brokenness and not allowing the Lord to heal that area of our life. What do we do? Three things. Let's go. I'll give them to you. You can write them down. See the light, be the light, and then share or show the light. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Be the light. John 1.4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What does that mean? It means it starts with him. It starts with the relationship with Christ. Your healing starts with Him. It starts with seeing the light. Do you know that the children of Israel, it said that they were led by day by a cloud and by night a pillar of fire to be a light that led them. Second Samuel, David says, You, O Lord, are my lamp. Job says, in Job, He has redeemed my soul and I will live to enjoy the light. You experience His grace and you experience His life and His light when you make Him Lord and Savior. 
So you've got to see the light, but then you've got to be the light. You can't be the light until you see the light. It, the Bible says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I've promised it once and I'll promise it again. I will obey your righteous regulations. Be the light, it's saying. That doesn't mean that God is some genie in a bottle, though, okay? He's not some kind of abracadabra God. I got you in my back pocket, and when I need you, I'll call on you. He says, you've got to see the need for your Savior, and then you've got to uh, be that light and that love that he gives. That's where you receive your grace. And here's the neat part. When you see the light and you're being the light, the third one comes naturally. You're just showing it because you're transformed. You're sharing that light because you've let him do that work within your heart and within your life. When you see the light, salvation. When you be the light, uh, discipleship, disciplining yourself for the purposes of godliness. Then the last one just has a residual effect. It comes because you're doing the first two. And he says, then all of a sudden, things change. Things change. People start to see Jesus in you. People start to see that light and that love in, in you. You'll, you'll make right choices. People will see it. You don't participate in, in things that you know you shouldn't. People watch that. Remember last, last week we said people like to watch people? You know, they're watching to see how we react. They're wa watching to see, do we take part in those off-the-wall, off-colored jokes? They're watching to see if we say one thing here but do another thing over here. People are watching. The question is this, what are they seeing? What are they seeing? May we be a people that are effective. You know, the other day, I, I'd like to say I'm always in the habit of doing this, but not always, but I'll try to get Lisa her coat, and I'll hold it for her so she can put her coat on. And one of Drea's friends happened to be over, and we just did that naturally, and her friend went, aww. And it was just a, you know, girls do that. And I thought, what are you, what are you doing? She goes, oh, that's so sweet. And I thought, putting the coat on? She goes, yeah, she goes, my dad doesn't do that for my mom. He says, get your coat, let's go. <laughs> but you know what it spoke to me? People are watching. They're watching. What are we projecting, light or dark? Are we projecting compromise or are we all in? Are we projecting our commitment to Christ or are we saying we would rather take a shortcut? People are watching. The question is, what are they seeing? May we, may you and I, be a people that are effective. And we know how to share that light and that love and walk as children of the light. Amen?